I got my Bachelor of Architecture degree at North Carolina State University, College of Design, and a four-year degree. And from there, went on to Boston, where I worked in architectural firms before heading out to Berkeley for grad school in 1989, just in time for the Loma Prieta earthquake. It was exciting for my first you know, terra firma surf ride. It was good. Uh, and uh, then been, uh, as part of that program, worked in Tokyo for a summer, uh, and then settled back here in, in the Bay Area and have been working in the Bay Area ever since. I spent 10 years with Holt Tenshaw as a firm no longer in existence that was here in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, that was actually the first time I got introduced to Arup. We did some work together for an aquarium in Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, uh, then eventually started my own firm with another part, uh, principal from, uh, from uh, Holt Inshaw. And then ended up uh, leaving that firm, selling my shares to go into prefabricated modular home design with Michelle Kaufman Designs. And I uh, did that. And it was actually three months into that experience. I was managing their architectural office for that. And three months into that, reported for surgery uh, for a brain tumor and uh, ended up, um, after the surgery, losing my sight a couple days later. And uh, so then I kind of oddly decided to go back to work about a month later and start figuring it out. I hadn't even started my training. Training, I ultimately got it mostly at the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, but really wanted to get back. To it. You can go check it out. There, there are no books on how to be a blind architect. Doesn't exist. Uh, but uh, I was really convinced that there were some thing, plenty of things I could do with outside uh, in the field. But I was more interested in, in finding ways to be, have a creative position in architecture and to continue the more sort of general practice that I'd always enjoyed in architecture. Uh, and it was actually through kind of uh, the, the resources, the community in, of people that are blind and visually impaired in the Bay Area that I quickly got connected with, with really unique uh, technologies, things that Naomi works with at the Mad Lab. Not so much uh, what she, she doesn't, they don't often use it there anymore, but I have a large, large format embossing printer that prints drawings in, in tactile form. So as I work with other architects, uh, they just send me drawings in, in PDF form. I print them and then can read them through touch and then developed ways to draw on that and share and communicate with, with others uh, to do that work. Uh, so it's really, in, in the end, it started doing a lot of really specializing in projects for the blind and visually impaired. Uh, that's, I didn't know, sort of know, know that as a specialty group, but it's kind of my market. And I have a high barrier to entry for those that want to go into it. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's really rewarding work in that there's what I've really found about, uh, about my work in architecture and working uh, through this kind of environment was that there was so much more to architecture that I, I really didn't focus on when I was sighted. And, and ironically, it feels like now it's, it's, I'm more surprised by how much I was missing when I was sighted than what I'm working with now. It seems like the visual stuff is kind of easy to deal with. That's well known. It's working with acoustics, all sorts of other tactile palettes, and the real sort of feel of the, the body and space in architecture that is so much more rewarding and I really think makes for much more enriched, uh, uh, really rich and de deep environments. So uh, it's really been a, a sort of a, quite an adventure, but through working with People like this panel up here, a really uh, great group of people to collaborate with and plenty of others uh, have had plenty of opportunities to do some really wonderful work and make differences in, in, in sort of architecture in general. And it's most exciting when it's not just about accessibility. There are a couple things I like to do with it. One is about making the process of architecture accessible. That would be for clients that are blind and visually impaired. Uh, but also toying with the idea of, of uh, something more than functionality. I don't, I don't think any of us inspire for architecture just to make it work and just to make it functional. Uh, if you think of the uh, Vitruvius's three books of architecture, firmness, commodity, and delight, uh, 
I was interested in delight if you can't see it or delight through different human experiences, different abilities, and how that notion of delight gets translated or experienced through uh, different modalities. So um, that to me is so much more exciting. And through that, I've actually had opportunities, have done some work for like a master plan for a zoo uh, where the exhibit designer brought me in, not for accessibility per se, but to design things that they typically overlook and to really design immersive environments in a zoo experience where just the whole experience, the whole sensory experience is supporting the, the greater uh, sort of design experience and the, the curatorial exhibit experience of a zoo. So it's really exciting to get to, to sort of have a broader impact and a broader opportunity to work in things from uh, buildings for the blind and visually impaired to things in the public realm for, for everyone. So who's next? Chris, I'm showing the slide that says uh, that it says I've been doing architecture for so long, I could do it with my eyes closed. Yeah. So, uh, so next we're going to have Katie. Thank you. Um, so like was mentioned earlier, I started off my career in structural engineering. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of, the University of Illinois. And I do have to give a slight shout out to my uh, wonderful late father who suggested when I was trying to decide what to major in an undergrad, he said, you know, why don't you think about architecture? You know, you really love math and science, and, but also art. And, um, you know, I, I really think that that would be a great fit for you. But of course, being 17, I couldn't listen to what my dad had to say. So I decided at the time that I wanted to favor the more uh, math and science and physics side of my passions. And, got my degree in engineering, and then started working and quickly realized that my dad was right. <laughs> but I worked for a few years as an engineer in Chicago. Um, the next slide is a building I worked on. Um, it's the uh, Marshall Fields building in downtown Chicago, designed by Daniel Burnham. Um, the work I did in that building was not particularly interesting. I inspected beams to make sure they were not too corroded, and it was <laughs> really one of those projects that, like, it was great to work in the guts of this beautiful historic building, but it also sort of confirmed that I wanted to do more than work with beams. I wanted to work with the whole experience of the building instead. Um, so then I went to Michigan in their three-year MARC program, um, and uh, moved to the Bay Area right after that. So I escaped the cold Midwestern winters and came out here. Um, I started my career in San Francisco working for the office of Charles Blosies. Um, he's an architect who's had a practice in the city for quite a while. Um, his firm focuses on mainly adaptive reuse projects. Um, he's also an architect and structural engineer, so I kept doing structures as well as architecture uh, while I worked with him. I was there for about nine years. And interestingly, one of the first buildings I worked on was another Daniel Burnham building in San Francisco. Um, this one was a restoration and addition to a historic building. So it's nice to work on Burnham's West Coast project once I got here. Um, a couple other projects I worked on with Chuck were the Blue Dot showroom on Valencia Street. This was an old furniture store that we reclad and modernized for Blue Dot. And then um, uh, Chuck had also done a new addition to a building at 1 Kearney Street. And as part of the public art component of the project, uh, the owner hired uh, Iwamoto Scott and Chuck's office to work together on this uh, lobby design, which is open to the public. You can go in there and, and walk through. It's the, how you get to the um, public open space terrace on the roof of this building. So you guys should go check it out sometime at 1 Kearney Street. Um, and then about five years ago, uh, I joined Mark Cavaniero's office. And it's been a really um, great experience working with the clients that Mark works with. Um, Lighthouse for the Blind was my first project that I worked on once I joined Mark's office. And we'll talk about that in great detail here in a few minutes. Um, worked with a lot of really other great clients. We just completed a building for the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, that I managed, and that's um, a new education center. So it's a couple blocks down from the main aquarium in Monterey, and it's the place where school groups will go to get an uh, immersive, hands-on educational experience before walking down to the aquarium and running around and going nuts for a while. So it's um, really in service of their mission to inspire conservation of the oceans. And um, the inspiration for the form of the building was uh, taking cues from the old existing warehouse buildings on Cannery Row in Monterey 
but reinterpreted it in a more modern um, expression and providing a lot of openness along the, the glass facade that you see there, which is the main circulation core. Um, and then another project that we're working on now, which is currently under construction, is a new building for the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. This is at 200 Van Ness. It's actually right next door to one of the Academy of Art University buildings on Haight Street. Um, this is a 12-story building. It's primarily student housing, which is obviously you know, a great need in San Francisco. Um, so it'll be student housing for the Conservatory of Music students, as well as uh, three really beautiful jewel box performance spaces where they'll put on um, hundreds of free concerts a year. Um, and uh, there'll be you know, a terrace and restaurant space. Um, it's, it's a building that contains a multitude of programs for a multitude of users. It's been a really interesting one. And now I'll hand it off to Naomi. All right. Hi, I'm Naomi Rosenberg. I'm, the, I'm a senior designer in the Media and Accessible Design Lab. Um, I actually had a very similar story to you, Katie. My dad, I was good at math and art, and my dad said, you should become an architect. He was an engineer, and uh, I said no. Yep. <laughs> so I went and got my BA from Oberlin College in studio art. Um, I took a lot of other classes there as well, but mostly a lot of studio art, a lot of sculpture. Um, and then I graduated a little before 2008, but ended up on the job market in 2008, which maybe you know was a terrible time to look for jobs. Um, so I ended up working at Pete's Coffee, which is where I'd worked before college. Um, I was a barista for a while. I worked as a home care attendant with um, working for somebody who uh, was in a wheelchair. Um, I worked with a early dementia, somebody who's experiencing early stages of dementia for about a year. Um, and this kind of all pushed me into, I should think about grad school. I think I'm ready to go back to something else. Um, and so I took a, a summer course at UC Berkeley and realized that it was, my dad was right. <laughs> Oops. Um, and so I went, I got my three-year um, master's program. I went, I got my three-year degree from UC Berkeley in uh, architecture. Um, during this time, I took a class from Chris Downey. He was teaching the uh, ADA and uni Universal Design Construction class. I think I was the only grad student in architecture in that class. There was a grad landscape and a few undergrad architecture. Um, it should be required. But um, the project that I've got up on the uh, screen right now, it's a project that was the final project for Chris Downey's class. Um, it was adjusting Sather Tower uh, to be more accessible. And Chris has later used this in subsequent classes as an example of what not to do. Um, so, so you know, it's a laser cut uh, model showing, um, we basically just built a tower next to Sather Tower with an elevator and staircase around it. So, you know, it was a no-go, but um, I think the model turned out pretty cool. Um, all, everyone in architecture told me, do not put this in your portfolio. <laughs> so, but I actually used it to get my job at Lighthouse for the Blind. They were pretty excited about it. Um, so, so yeah, then I went to, I, I talked to Chris. He suggested I talk to um, folks at Lighthouse. I was looking for work after a brief stint in Chicago. I actually worked at the Roby House in Chicago for a little bit. Um, I was an intern at the Department of Buildings in Chicago, which was like, Definitely didn't want to go into that field. Um, and so, yeah, so now I'm a senior designer, uh, which means that I oversee a lot of projects and uh, I do a lot of design myself. Um, up on the screen, we've got two images of tactile Frida Kahlo's. Um, those are over on the table on to my right, if you want to check out a few of those. Um, and the Mad Lab's purpose is to make accessible visual information to people who are blind or visually impaired. And so a lot of that is print media, um, making braille and audio, um, but also tactile maps and tactile graphics. So imagine you're in a class and you get a graph from your teacher and how showing the breakdown of some de demographics. Well, if someone's blind, you only get that auditorily or written in text. And so we, we produce a lot of tactile graphics in um, similar formats to what you would receive uh, in print. Um, this also extends to digital media. We've been working a lot with tech companies who produce apps that have a very spatial layout. And so how do you 
if you know the spatial layout of something on your screen, it makes a lot more sense. Um, so we recently worked with Apple to produce um, the tactile accompanying maps for their Learn to Code Swift Playgrounds app. Um, and as I mentioned, we've done a bunch of tactile maps for um, local museums and amusement parks down south. Um, so the next one. So um, producing all this tactile material one by piece by piece is quite expensive and really hard to get for most users. And so we've been developing some automated methods for our tactile production. So this leads me to our project, Tactile Maps Automated Production. Um, it's kind of like Google Maps for blind people. You type in an address, generates a file, and you can use it to emboss um, on, on an embosser, um, which is a tactile printer. Um, and so what I've got up here is an image of a satellite view of where we are right now um, from Google Maps. And the next slide is the Google Maps image. So it's kind of being distilled into some graphic information for you. And then the next slide is the, the tactile uh, file that we would generate using team, from TMAP. Um, and that shows print, and then we've got Braille up here. And the next is, um, I just wanted to focus on the next file. It's hard to see, but you may be able to see it in some of the things being passed around. It's the resolution is very different from the print file, or from the, the digital file to what's actually printed. So when we're designing, kind of like everyone in this room, hopefully when, when you're designing, you're taking into account the production materials and what it is that you're using to produce those things. And so our embossers can only produce at a certain resolution, but also our users can only read at a certain resolution. So we produce to the resolution of a fingertip. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. All right, thanks. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shane Murbeck. I'm an associate in the Acoustics, Audio, Visual, and Theater group at Arup, AAVT for short. We made sure to have two A's at the beginning, so we'd be the first group at Arup, you know, when we started. So. Um, my background is pretty different. I'm a musician, um, and I spent a long time trying to figure out what that meant in terms of, of a professional life. So the, the top left there is my, uh, my band photo from when I was 15, my goth band. We were called Haven. Um, thank you. Um, so, you know, from, from the time when music became really important to me to the time I actually figured out what to do with it, the path was very kind of, uh, very varied. So this is, in the top right, is the uh, restaurant that I managed in Boston when I was trying to figure out my way, my path and my way. So it was like I was a musician, but I was a waiter, but, you know, which, which one was the, was the right balance? Um, Eventually, while I was spending time in Boston, I decided that my, you know, an interest in music and technology kind of led to a recording studio world, right? So um, I focused on getting a degree in audio technology and in recording music and that sort of thing. Um, but it turned out that as much as I was working in studios, I still had to work in the restaurants to make enough money to live in Boston. So it was kind of like, didn't really feel like it was quite working out. How that manifested itself in terms of college, um, I called this the old college try because I tried college a lot of times. Um, <laughs> so I went to, it was actually, I went to college six times. I went to one of these colleges twice. Um, so between graduating high school and 2005 or so, I tried to major in English literature, American history, philosophy, and music performance. Um, and none of them quite stuck. Um, I eventually got a degree in audio and media technology, which, you know, I was able to use some of the coursework I'd done before, but not really. <laughs> um, it was kind of starting, starting fresh. So I'd, I graduated there in 2007, and I was um, just about to take a studio gig in New York and leave my friends and family back in Boston, um, when actually this uh, picture on the bottom left happened. We'd started a performing arts collective in Boston and just kind of realized that it was the more important and more timely thing at that time. So decided to ditch the studio gig, stay there, figure out what that was all about. And then kind of through that process, started discovering like things I liked more about my degree and other options, you know, that were available based on my degree. And so that's when I found a graduate school at um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. 
So it was a combined architectural sciences and MFA program, kind of loosely combined. They weren't technically combined, but I, I hung out a lot with the MFA kids. and um, So that kind of compiled everything into this um, combined like uh, technical acoustics track and also my, my artwork. And so that led to Arup. So if you don't know Arup, Arup is a global building engineering firm. Um, it's about 14,000 people worldwide. We have 90 something offices. Uh, there are more disciplines at Arup than I can even fathom. It feels like I've been there 10 years and it feels like every day you learn about a new specialty. So acoustics, audio, visual, and theater is like a small, small portion of, of the global Arup. But it's all the, it's basically everything with, that, ha that it takes to make a building or a plan a city without the architecture. So, um, in terms of projects at Arup, there's a very wide variety, you know, given the size of the firm and the various disciplines. Um, yeah, there's a, you know, it could be anything from like a infrastructure related to the high speed rail down to like, you know, figuring out what seals to put on a conference room door or something. Um, a few that I've worked on in addition to the lighthouse, uh, as was mentioned, SF MoMA, the expansion project. Um, that actually started with a, an exhibit that we designed at MoMA, which is actually why uh, Chris and I met at first, um, and then turned into the kind of larger building project. Um, this is the um, Tau Atrium at the at SF Opera at the War Memorial Veterans Building with MCA. Uh, and then the Apple Park, which is the spaceship uh, Foster's Apple Office Building down in Cupertino. Um, and a few others uh, to highlight. This one is one of my personal art projects, which I used the sound studio at Arup to, to design. But it's a collaboration with NASA um, called the Orbit Pavilion. This is at the Huntington Gardens in Pasadena. And so this is a... It, it, it's a, as you can see, there are a lot of speakers kind of around a hemisphere in this, in this seashell-looking thing. And so what it does is it tracks the positions of a bunch of different Earth science satellites that NASA has as current missions and assigns a sound to each of those satellites. So when you hear a sound kind of emitting from a certain space and if you point to it, you're pointing to the current location of that satellite out in space. And some of them, there's a, the Huntington Gardens is a large botanical garden, so you, there's actually little enough light pollution that sometimes at night you can, you can actually see the satellites blinking away as you're pointing to them. Um, and another project that definitely combined kind of all of those things into one was this uh, recent collaboration with Bjork that was mentioned at the beginning. So she, um, I had uh, started to work with her in five or so years ago on a project that was like a very kind of random connection, you know, that it, I eventually got to meet her. Uh, it didn't really work out, but, um, or, you know, the the project didn't move forward, but uh, at the kind of end of last year, her manager emailed me back and was like, she has this crazy idea. I don't know if it's going to work, but, you know, do you think you can do it? And, of course, the answer is yes, uh, you, regardless of what the actual project was. But um, So what she wanted to do was, you know, she has, she's always in her career um, combined kind of this very digital outlook with a very, like, natural biophilic outlook. And so she wanted to take... Uh, her live performance, which was always very tech heavy and very kind of like, you know, flashy and, and um, um, digital. And she wanted to bring her, what she calls her acoustic voice into that experience. So she feels like she has kind of two voices, one that she sings in on stage, you know, where she has the mic and she's, she's kind of loud and like at a, certain, at a certain pitch at a certain level. And then the other is her, her private or acoustic voice, which she would sing in you know, at home or on walks. She claims she composes all her music uh, walking alone in the woods of Iceland. I'm just going just gonna to hope that that's true. Um, so what we did was we built this room that she, you can see her standing in in this, in this uh, image here that has a totally natural acoustic. So it's just a, a passive space that she goes in and it's very live and reverberant. Um, and she kind of take you know, puts the mic that she uses on the on stage, puts that away, and just sings in this room naturally, and that's what gets projected back out to the audience. So it's currently on tour. Uh, they're playing in London tonight. So, Okay. So that's the introduction. Now we're going to switch the, to the project. So let's start talking about the lighthouse. Chris, I have this slide that has uh, community skills and confidence. Do you want me to hand it to you? Sure. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Shane. And so this is the, sort of the intro to the, the Lighthouse project. And 
with this, what we skipped over, well, sort of the blind experience. And it's something you think about as an architect. You think about how, how your client, how your users are going to use a building. And in this case, people that would go to the, blind, the lighthouse for the blind and visually impaired wouldn't drive there. Uh, they typically would take public transit. And we selected the site because it's right next to the Civic Center BART station. And you come up the right exit, come out the stairs and hang a left, and you're at the front door of the building. And we're up on the, uh, the 9th, 10th, and 11th floors. And I, what, this, so the Lighthouse for the Blind, just to share a little bit about what they do. As I said, that's where I went for a lot of the training that I needed when I first lost my sight. Uh, so they provide training in what's called orientation and mobility. That's how to get around safely um, with non-visual skills uh, or with some, some visual skills if you have some remaining sight. In my case, I have no sight at all. Uh, and, and so I was very much about cane travel and, and using a cane to, to get around uh, effectively through the environment, both to interpret the environment around me and to understand it and get around safely. Uh, so, uh, but there's also living skills, learning how to cook, uh, learning how to read Braille, learning technology, all sorts of accessible technologies. Uh, so they do a lot of training in all those things, li just general life skills, life coaching, um, and uh, advocacy, all sorts of things. And as you ex heard from Naomi, uh, work in accessible media. So, um, so next, uh, interestingly enough, the building that, that uh, Katie is now working on, on Van Ness, is our old site. Uh, when we, we started a conversation uh, at the Lighthouse, uh, I, I went from student, being a student there, to then I joined the board. And now I'm the, uh, for another month and a half, I, I'm the chairman of the board of directors. So I'll interchangeably use we, although as a consultant sitting up here, it's, they're my client <laughs> for, for that project because it gets a little confusing. But uh, at, the, at the Lighthouse, years ago, we, got, we were looking at expanding, and it was at our uh, existing uh, site at, uh, on Van Ness. And we, we couldn't expand the building enough. We had an option to buy the site next door. Uh, I had a really interesting conversation with Mark Cavaniero. He was on a bike ride. I called him up. He asked him the phone pulled over uh, on a Saturday. And we started talking about that project. And he got involved, and we explored how to do a joint project with uh, the San Francisco, San Francisco Conservatory of Music for their dormitories in the Lighthouse, having their site there as well. Uh, that didn't pan out for the Lighthouse. We wanted a new building that we could get in, uh, a building that we could get into quickly, that we wouldn't have to move out of to do the, tear it down to do the work, and it was just too disruptive, all sorts of challenges with it. And we quickly found this building right on Market Street, right at the BART station, which made all the sense in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, through a, uh, architect selection, we ended up sticking with Mark Cavaniero in their office and, and uh, had a really wonderful collaboration where I was uh, teamed with them as a consultant, uh, working with them uh, through for this blind experience, blind and visually impaired experience. So they're located on the top three floors, floors 9, 10, 11. The, uh, have we switched? Yeah, so we're on the Axon drawing. The tenth floor is the main reception area, so you take the elevator up to the tenth floor. Uh, admin is the floor below in what we call immersion uh, and rehab on the eleventh floor. And the idea was that was was that uh, you know they're sort of lost going from their own building on Venice that had some iconic presence, as miserable and old and tired and exhausted as it was, at least had their own street frontage here. It's kind of invisible in the top of this building, and you come up, and the real sort of curb experience, that curb appeal, is what happens when you first uh, in, come in off the elevator to the 10th floor. If you're sighted, you look out, and you could see we cut in some new stairs. There weren't stairs in the uh, linking these three floors initially, but for the sense of community, it was important to get those stairs so you didn't have to move from floor to floor through an elevator. Uh, and uh, also, the sense that you could, you could hear things, you could see things, you could get a sense of a larger organization, a larger community uh, uh, through this whole, whole link space, the three top floors, uh, floors of this building. Um, 
So with that, the design brief, uh, there was it's somewhat of a critique of the old building, but also the executive director, a, a gentleman by the name of Brian Bashan, is blind himself. And he remembered when he first lost his sight and finally went in to get some rehabilitation training uh, and how miserable the experience was. First, it's a moment that's kind of, you're really anxious. As they say in the business, there's not too many people that show up excited to be there. Nobody really wants to be there. It's what they have to do. And his experience was it was very much of a sort of a, a service. It was uh, public social services. There was a humming fluorescent light you know, fixture overhead, a noisy uh, condenser for a, a bidding machine not far away. The upholstery was, was ratty and, and you know, disrepair. And he was like, this is just miserable. And uh, there, there goes the kickoff for this new experience. So he wanted that moment you walk out, in, out of the elevator into this building, into this space, that it was going to be exciting. It's, a, it's about uh, promise. It's about uh, exciting new things to come and learning from other people and hearing all this sort, sort of conversation and, and excitement. So it was, it was all of a sudden to confront that anxiety you might be having to really convert that immediately into excitement for new possibilities. So working with Brian, um, you know, the, the four kind of, um, you know, uh, key points of the design brief are up on the screen. One is high contrast. So uh, one fact about the blind and visually impaired is that most people who are blind or visually impaired have some amount of sight. Um, I think it's kind of a common misperception that you're either sighted or have no vision at all. Um, but a lot of people that the Lighthouse serves have some amount of sight, and to really maximize the use of that sight, um, you know, we had the directive to use really high contrast materials, as well as in service of the idea that the, um, the space would be warm and welcoming, you know, we, they, they wanted it to be really colorful. And again, to maximize visibility, um, really rich jewel tone colors are more discernible to people with low vision than more muted colors. It's kind of, you know, it makes sense when you think about it. Um, but where we do have color, it's very saturated and rich um, in order to... Um, really uh, emphasize the, the visibility of it. And then um, visual and acoustic warmth was a really big part of what we were going for as well. Um, when you walk into the space, and we'll show some slides in a minute, you're really, it, it, you, it's the feeling of being enveloped in this warm, wood-lined room. Um, but if you can't see the wood, you still feel the warmth because of the acoustic treatment that was applied in the space. And so, um, you know, wherever we used a material um, like wood to, to bring in some warmth, um, you know, we, we didn't just use it on the ceiling. We would wrap it down the walls as well, so that way it could be touched if it couldn't be seen. That was something that was really important as well. We didn't want to bias the sighted by um, applying unique or special materials in a way that could only be seen if you had vision. Um, another aspect was wayfinding and making it really intuitive. Uh, the way the floors were arranged, um, the program spaces were either within or just outside of a main circulation track. Um, and the, the track was a polished concrete floor, which was determined after a lot of tests of various materials to have the best resonance with a cane tap um, to give really good acoustic feedback for cane users. Um, but most importantly, the Lighthouse really wanted a space to foster community. Um, they have a lot of events here, um, a lot of really pretty great parties, <laughs> um, but really to um, be able to come and meet folks who are going through a similar experience as you and um, learn from one another and from the Lighthouse staff. So the next section of the, the talk is about the design process. And, um, you know, as an architect with a, um, you know, um, you know, quite a bit of experience coming into this project. It was interesting because it was clear early on that like our traditional 
two-dimensional modes of representation are not useful when you're working with a client who's blind. Um, especially one of the great things about the lighthouse is that most of the decision makers at the lighthouse are themselves blind or visually impaired. Um, and so, you know, working with Chris and with Naomi and others in the Mad Lab, um, they provided us as architects the training we needed to figure out how to format graphics so that they could be legible in a tactile format. Um, if you can kind of imagine your standard, um, you know, design graphics, there might be leaders pointing to something or there might be um, shadow or things like that. We really had to pare down the information to clean it up to make it legible in a tactile format. A, a leader line is just a diagonal line that doesn't really serve any purpose in a tactile print. It just kind of muddies it and makes it confused. Similarly, um, the use of Braille, because you can't scale Braille. Otherwise, if it's smaller than the standard, you can't read it. And so figuring out how to make the drawings as clear and organized and precise as possible is really important. Um, and then this slide shows a um, section of a handrail design in wiki sticks, which uh, Chris put together as part of a design um, exploration. So this is another way that we would work back and forth on designs where we would develop a tactile print and then meet with Chris and work together and you know he would sketch something with the wax sticks and then we would you know modify the wax sticks to sketch something back and so that way we're able to um, sketch ideas in real time instead of relying on the um, time it takes to format the tactile prints, print them and then um, get feedback. And then this is just a, a meeting in the old lighthouse, the old, <laughs> the old um, not well lit lighthouse um, with Chris, obviously, and uh, Brian Bashan, the executive director. So another uh, key piece of the design process for us was the use of uh, the Arab Sound Lab. So. The Sound Lab is a place, it's that word oralization that we heard uh, earlier. So it's a, it's a place that we use at Arup to be able to render the acoustics of a space. And so whereas a visual render you can always do on a screen and in 2D, to really simulate acoustics you have to have kind of an immersive uh, platform to do that. So um, you need a room that's very quiet and that's very neutral on its own, uh, which is what the Sound Labs are. Um, and then you need a lot of loudspeakers. <laughs> so uh, they're, they're typically like a, some, somewhat of a sphere of loudspeakers that you sit inside. And you can take the output of a computer modeling program or of a 3D recording process and, re and construct, either reconstruct or kind of pre-construct uh, a soundscape of a building. So um, Chris and I had done a lot of exploration in the Sound Lab over the years um, since uh, we first met in Oh nine or something like that, um, where we had you know kind of collaborated on different ways to 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 kind of workshop acoustic wayfinding. Like what what were the what were acoustic beacons that people could identify? You know whether they were sighted or blind. Um, you know could we add, you know acoustically add in different elements and see if they would work? We had this one AIA event where we brought a bunch of people down to BART and blindfolded them <laughs> and uh, made them try to get, to get to the gates. And then we, brought, we came back up to the sound lab and then had you know, the, that same soundscape recorded and dropped in different types of acoustic beacons, like a fountain or a different uh, Bing of the Muni turnstiles or, or what have you. So we had done a lot of kind of um, you know, theoretical work, but the lighthouse, the, the, the headquarters project was a chance to put that into direct use. Um, so we simulated, well, so typically, we, you know, that we use the sound lab for a lot of different clients, right? And it's a, it's a direct communication tool. It's a way to hear what, what we're talking about rather than to try to describe it. Um, a typical client will come in and listen to maybe three or four different scenarios and be there for 30 minutes to an hour. The lighthouse, it was... I've lost count. Every time I say it, it gets it gets more. But I know there were, <laughs> I know there were at least three sessions that were hours, like three to four hours, right? Yeah, yeah. And we would go and we would listen, and the room would get too hot, and we'd go to a meeting room and we'd talk about what we heard, and then go back and listen, and then talk about what we were going to do the next time. And it was a really, it's a fascinating acoustic design process because typically, you know, most sighted people don't 
hear that or don't don't listen that closely, right? Everyone or you know many people hear the same, but they don't they don't necessarily listen to all the details, right? So when you're talking to a, a typical client, you have to make the the acoustic options very clear and distinct, and they are typically very very different. Uh, in the Lighthouse's case, the listening was was highly detailed, whereas you know most sighted people wouldn't really know the difference. But Chris and Brian and uh, Scott Blanks, who's uh, also at the Lighthouse, you know, sat there and kind of listened in great detail. And each uh, progressive sound lab demo got even more detailed than the last. So, yeah, you yeah. I just wanted to, to add something about it because it's it's something that came out of a that this collaboration we were doing before we did the Lighthouse project. It came from an experience I had for an, another project where I described to uh, the acoustic engineer on that project that to get across the lobby space, a two-story lobby space, we had an opportunity to be able to, to hear if you could walk underneath the, a bridge that went overhead that really defined the sort of center spline of, of that space. Because if you're blind, it's really hard to go right down the middle of the space. You, know, you do that with sight. But it, I'm, I realized that if we could hear the bridge overhead, if you could hear from the cane tap, when your cane hits the ground, you don't listen to the sound coming right back to the ear. You hear it go out into the space around you, hit surfaces, and come back to your ear. So I hy hypothesized that if we designed it right, we would be able to hear if you're underneath that bridge going right down the center of the space, uh, or if you veered off to the side. And so we talked about it. We worked with it. He said, okay, I got it. I was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah. But just in case, we'll put in conduit for speakers in the future if we need to put in some sound to, to cover up for it, to make it work. And I was like, that's the best you can do? <laughs> really? And it, it really pointed out how visually we have so many tools to work with. But when you want to design how a building sounds, which is something that's really critical if you experience a building with outside, the acoustics, that's the one sense that you can really, so it's like the next sense in the sequence of things of how you can experience the experience the space beyond the reach of your your fingertips so you 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 can see sight in the distance but you can also hear space in the distance you can hear beyond your immediate body so this idea of trying to be more uh imp impactful and more uh strategic about how to design with sort of the the acoustic quality and feedback of the space to make it uh, more effective and, and also more engaging uh, as part of that process so you can really understand the building as you move through it. So it really started this really rich sort of collaboration of modeling things and studying it just like you would visually, only we're stepping into the sound lab to be really critical and use it as a design tool, not just as a modeling tool. So as a, I mean, I'm an acoustic specialist. I've like devoted my life to sound. I've spent a lot of time listening. Um, one of the amazing things about working with the Lighthouse was recontextualizing a lot of those experiences and thinking about different ways to listen, um, you know, functionally and in terms of wayfinding that I hadn't really experienced before. And um, from a materials perspective, there were some interesting kind of revelations early on, like. You know, we were talking about the cane taps and which, which uh, surfaces would be the, the right ones to use. And the old Arup office had a nice sustainable bamboo wood floor on a, on a raised access floor. And it was kind of like, well, what about this floor? This, this is nice. Everyone, everyone likes this. And, uh, yeah, everyone at the lighthouse was like, oh, that thing, it feels like plastic. It feels so cheap. Like, we, we can't have that in our headquarters. And I was like, okay, okay, not that. <laughs> um, Carpet is a is the is the cane killer, right? So a lot of you know commercial interiors, you'll have, you know, maybe a wood reception area, but then as you go into the desk space, it's all carpet. So that's that's a a great way to get lost as a person who's navigating by cane. Uh, concrete was always kind of you know something that had a really it it felt like a like a quality, right, Chris? You described it like that. Like it feels solid. It feels like it you know it has a both the acoustic but also the tactile kind of feedback. Um, cork we explored for a while. We I, That kind of just, I forget why we didn't use cork. It just kind of... Just, just, just concerned about it, uh, durability. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, we liked it because it was kind of hard, but it's also a good natural material. And for those uh, with chemical sensitivities, it's, it's good in that it, it doesn't collect all the dust and stuff that gets cooked up every time it gets vacuumed. So it has some advantages, but the executive director was concerned about the durability. So to be able to simulate all of these in the sound lab, it was kind of like a, like a movie sound design process where um, Chris and I have gone on a lot of recording adventures in the past to, to record different soundscapes and different kind of paths of transit and that sort of thing. But so we would, we would find rooms that had, you know, a cork floor but a very sound-absorbing ceiling. So it was like it was naturally very quiet and we'd record the cane taps and then have to simulate those cane taps and virtually place them in the model of the space that we were working with. Um, so there was a bit of a sound design gathering process here to, to get all these materials to be able to simulate them. Um, so we're moving on to the reception where we did do, do a lot of simulation, but I've been talking for a while, so maybe, Katie, do you want to talk reception? So the reception space, like, uh, like Chris mentioned, when you come into the 10th floor of the new lighthouse, this is really your entry and your welcome to the space. Um, we, as you can see in the photo, we wrapped the walls and ceiling with wood slats, which um, are an acoustically absorptive material. Uh, you know, there's space between the slats with uh, sound absorbing material behind. So it really um, helps to control sound in the space. Um, and then you can see the polished concrete floor, um, you know, kind of the spine leading you to this new connecting stair in the background. Um, and you, you might be able to see it in the photo, but there's a, a strip on either side of the polished concrete because we do have some sort of open carpeted areas. And, you know, with the feedback from the lighthouse, it was, you know, we didn't want to have this whole space be carpeted because then it's harder, it's harder to navigate. But by cutting the track through the middle of the lobby, um, we lined the edges of the carpet with a metal strip, which through testing with the lighthouse, it was determined that it gave a really nice um, uh, audible uh, sound difference when it was tapped with a cane. And that helps define the boundary of an open space. So you can determine if you're in the middle of a field or on the edge of the field by this marker between the two floor materials. Um, the, the desk, we worked with the lighthouse and with Chris um, to do a bunch of mock-ups, full-size mock-ups. We um, busted out our modeling skills from grad school and made foam core uh, mock-ups of the desk to make sure that it was the right height and that all the components were in a good spot to have it be a welcoming um, you know, physical um, element in the space. And then, um, Chris, the cane notch photo is up. I don't know if you want to talk about this. This is a special feature in the lighthouse. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we were actually, I think it was in a conversation with Katie at, uh, and early on in the process before we demoed the existing space. And there was a reception desk on the 11th floor that was a, like an 80s spectacular, you know, it was, like, it was the, the thing of the 80s. It was round, uh, sort of a half donut and modular and it had a glass uh, countertop on the top of it. And it was... They were, it was done in sections, and, and so there was this actually this little gap uh, with beveled edges where the, the glass made that corner to turn into this, this gap. And in conversation with Katie, I needed to, I needed to talk with my hands. So, so I, sit, I just happened to lean, lean my cane up against it, and it was like, it's stuck there. It's like, that's cool. And stop the conversation. We need to do that at the reception desk. Uh, and, which we which we did, and it's a really simple thing. There are other ways we could do it, uh, but there's a number of things that work. And the idea was that if you're if you're blind and you're a cane user, you have to find fill a form or have a conversation. It's really nice to be able to lean your cane someplace, but if you have a long straight uh, reception desk and you don't have a corner nearby, there's no place to put it. So you ended up having it like in your face, uh, trying to. I stand it there, and, and uh, so we just thought we could add these these cane notches all around at places where you need it, out of the side, not right in front of you, or in places where people might stop and have a conversation. Okay. Why don't I describe what you're going to hear first, and then we can play it. Nice. Um, okay. So the idea with the reception area acoustically was that we wanted to – this is a main – uh, place for acoustic wayfinding. So we wanted people to arrive off the elevator bay and to, um, you know, understand which which direction would would be which thing. So um, 
you, the elevator bay was part of the base building, so we didn't change it, and it's very kind of like loud and reverberant. There's no soft surface in there. And then the idea was you would uh, be led into the, you know, kind of acoustically led into the reception area. And um, so you have from the, you can't quite see it in the picture here, but just, you know, basically where this picture is taken from, you have the circulation area going all around the core of the building. Um, so you have the concrete, you know, kind of expanding to your, to your left and right. Uh, and then ahead of you, you can hear kind of a more, a softer, more absorptive surface. Um, and then you'd be led in to that, sort of, to that kind of softer space um, because you can hear the, the change acoustically. And then there was an important piece where the receptionist would greet you and we had to balance kind of a, you know, having their voice be clear and intelligible um, with also trying not to make the space too dead, right? So I think one of the big things we talked about a lot during the design was like that, that the lighthouse shouldn't feel institutional or clinical in any way. And one way to do that is to, you know, just have a suspended acoustic ceiling everywhere, right? Like many institutional buildings do. So we wanted to maintain kind of a, a bit of liveliness within the space while at the same time making the, um, making sure the receptionist's voice was, was clear and audible. So we, we modeled a lot. I forget how many surfaces. It was, uh, you know, we had options for no treatment on the ceiling, 50% absorptive on the ceiling, 100% absorptive on the ceiling, sound absorbing walls, all carpet, cork, concrete, um, wood, I think still. Um, you know, so then all the permutations of all those things, right? So you could switch on the, the sound absorbing ceiling, switch off the walls, switch on the carpet. And so through that process, which took quite a bit of time to kind of dial in, we ended up with, with a, a design that uh, everyone agreed on, which was, you know, keep, keep the co uh, concrete in the circulation, as Katie was talking about, um, have just half the ceiling be sound absorbing. So um, behind the wood slats, you can kind of put as much as, as you want or as little as you want. So it's about 50% of the surfaces are sound absorbing. And then we kept the wood slat wall um, partially because it, it softened the space a little bit more, but also because you have a, a more local reaction to it. So if you're nearer to the wall, you know, you can feel that sound absorbing surface near you. So there's some like acoustic uh, variety within the space. So the um, simulation I will play you um, is basically just, we won't go through all the iterations here, <laughs> um, but it's basically just if you were to go from all the solid surfaces, so this is a concrete floor, uh, drywall ceiling, no sound absorption. This is basically what a lot of commercial, you know, like class A office building lobbies are like, right? They, there's not a lot of, this would be kind of the default of a, of a, new, of a new office. And then we'll uh, play that um, and then switch to what we designed. So this is the, um, the reverberant one. So that was the receptionist greeting you, right? And you hear you have the you have the really strong cane feedback, but you don't get that kind of warmth and welcoming quality that we were looking for. So now let's switch to the sound absorbing surfaces. So you have something that's still kind of lively and, and has, has a bit of life to it, but um, is, you know, the, where the voice is much more intelligible and much clearer to hear. Um, so this was um, you know, kind of very detailed modeling, and, and you know, again, we went deep into the weeds on this one, but I, I remember when I was doing commissioning, um, kind of just, just before the building opened, we were making sure all the... HVAC system was balanced or whatever, one of the contractors came up to me and was like, hey, there's this cool thing. When you walk into the lobby, you can kind of hear the, you know, the circulation area go to the left and right, and then when you walk in, it gets nice and welcoming, but then you can hear all the different surf vertical surfaces. I was like, all right, if the contractor heard it, <laughs> that means it definitely, definitely worked. Actually, I, if I could, I had a uh, conversation with a receptionist at the lighthouse after they'd been in for a couple weeks, 
and uh, asked him you know, how it was to be there. And he's like, oh, it's awesome. And he's really animated and excited. And he was like describing how he could be there talking to somebody or be on the phone, hear all this stuff, hear the excitement down the hall, upstairs or whatever, but have a really easy, comfortable conversation on the phone or with the person right there. And I was like, cool. We modeled that. We designed it just like that. Thanks. Glad to hear it. It was a proof in concept. Science, right? <laughs> um, one other thing, this is this will be quick, but another kind of acoustic wayfinding detail that we put in the project were these, we have these training rooms that are just kind of sprinkled throughout the various floors. And um, we wanted to keep them open with no door because they, you know, they, they didn't need privacy and it's, it wanted to be a welcoming piece. Yeah, actually it was part of the design brief from the executive director who didn't want to have all the training behind closed doors uh, as part of the idea of walking around and hear what's going on. So the idea that you could, you know, it's, it's an inviting, it's an engaged place rather than, you know, sort of mysterious things, and mis you know, quiet classes behind the closed door. You could, wanted to have a space that you could get a sense of what was going on if you're sighted or blind. Uh, but then if you're inside it, that you had a suitable environment for what's really these days in adaptive technology training is really one-on-one. -on -one. It's not big classes and it's a small device. It's you know, training on your smartphone, on your laptop, whatever it is. So it's an intimate, small space, but uh, wanting to have that open, and, but yet still have a very effective, intimate space for that training. And so the, the way they feature as an acoustic wayfinding piece is um, that there's, there's kind of a canopy of sound absorption in these rooms. And because they're open, when you walk by uh, through the circulation, you get this, this uh, gradient, the acoustic gradient, right? So you have a kind of normal drywall on, on most of the um, circulation or the glass storefront systems for the offices. And then all of a sudden, there's a very kind of sound absorbing um, feature near you. So you, there's, that's part of the kind of detailing and, and yeah, like acoustic, uh, acoustic change that you can get in the building. The acoustic catcher's mitt. That's how you the acoustic catcher's mitt. That's right. That's how you, yeah, you can actually feel it physically when you walk into the space. It just really changes. Yeah. Okay. So now we're onto the interconnecting stair, and this is a Katie thing. So this is another element that, like we talked about, we wanted to connect all three levels so that you didn't have to go into the elevator to go from one floor to another and all the floors would be connected. Not only is it a circulation feature, though, it's also really an acoustic feature as well. Um, so part of the design brief, like, like Chris mentioned, was you know the Lighthouse wanted you to be able to get a sense of activity and excitement and possibility as you're walking through the space. And so when you come onto the 10th floor reception, you may hear a gathering up on the 11th floor lounge that's up right up, up the steps. Or you may hear you know, some folks talking on the 9th floor below because there's another kind of social gathering space just at the base of the stairs on the 9th floor. So they, we wanted to have that sense of connection, but we also wanted to control it and not have it be too loud or reverberant. So... Um, you know, was, this is again part of the acoustic uh, design of the space, and we chose um, wood surface for the stairs to help you know you know keep it from being too echoey as as people are walking up and down, but you could still get a sense of movement. Um, and the really important feature of the stair, though, is the handrail. Um, this was something that Chris really encouraged us to think about in a different way, rather than having your standard you know round tube handrail that that you see everywhere. Um, but that because the stair is such an important part of the space and it's something that, you know, anyone um, who uses the space, whether they're blind or sighted, will experience in, in very similar ways, to have this handrail be something that everyone can experience the same way, it's a, it's a real tactile feature of the space. So we made the handrail very special. <laughs> we went through a lot of design iterations. Um, first, we started with the wiki stick sketches with Chris and various lighthouse folks trying to come up with a way that, that you're, it just feels good in your hand when you grab it. You kind of grab it and you say, aha, that, that's special. Someone thought about this. This is an important feature of this space. Um, so we started with the wiki stick sketches and then did a series of 3D printed mock-ups for different handrail profiles just to see what felt best in the hand. Um, and then eventually a, a full-size mock-up with the 
um, finished product out of Ipe, which is a really hard Brazilian wood. The contractor did not like us for having them um, shape this out of Ipe. But it ended up just beautiful, and it works. I think that um, a lot of people who come to the lighthouse, you know, subconsciously or consciously just notice that this handrail is something different and special. Um, another aspect of the stairs that we spent a lot of time considering are the treads. Um, you know, you're required by code uh, to provide a contrast strip at the top and bottom riser of any run of stairs um, to aid in uh, visual um, uh, navigation, to, you know, give a visual clue that the level is changing. Um, but with the Lighthouse folks, they, they really wanted to have it be more than just the code minimum. They wanted to have the top and bottom treads, of course, stand out. But because of the, visual, the difference in visual acuity of a lot of the users of the Lighthouse, they thought it would be helpful to have the treads um, you know, marked on every riser instead of just the code minimum top and bottom. Um, and then as we were looking at the stairs, we, you know, we ended up using a, a metal strip um, for the nosing. It's kind of a standard stair or standard nosing or threshold profile. Um, but th that also ended up needing quite a bit of back and forth with the lighthouse. We, we, you know, kind of as architects just sort of selected a standard profile that we thought would look good and had the right amount of reflection, uh, surface reflection and thought we had it nailed. And then uh, the contractor put together a sample mock-up and um, I was showing it to Chris and Brian and, and Chris was like, why don't you put that on the floor? I want to see how it feels with the cane. And it ended up the profile we had selected was horrible because it had these grooves that just caught cane tips in just the right way that as a sighted person who doesn't use a cane, I never would have thought about. But uh, Brian and Chris like tested it and they're like, no, no, this isn't going to work. And so we ended up doing a bunch of 3D printed mock-ups for a custom uh, metal extrusion that had just the right amount of groove to be good for traction, but just shallow enough grooves um, so that they wouldn't catch cane tips. So this is another piece that is highly customized in the lighthouse. If I could go in deeper into the woods on the visual contrasting strip. Uh, we were curious that in, in trying to make it the, the sort of at the optimal level of contrast. So we refer to the Americans with Disabilities Act to see what their requirement is, and they currently don't define what that is. We went back to the original, back in the 1990-1991 version of ADA, where they described high visual contrast as providing 70% visual contrast. So uh, we wanted to get towards that 70% contrast, and we actually got lumens meters from the PG&E Energy Center and, and used it to, in the space to sort of get light uh, reflectance readings off of the stainless steel strips as a nosing strip within the wood, pro, the wood tread. Uh, and with the polished stainless steel, we got 70%. But the low vision users uh, were concerned about the reflectivity of light bouncing off the stainless, polished stainless steel. So we had another one done that was with uh, sandblasted stainless steel and they're like, yeah, well, that, the reflectivity is better with that, but we can't see it as well. And it was only getting 50% visual contrast. So we ended up going with the polished for the first and last nosing strip of each run of stairs with the sandblasted in the middle. So they had the good visibility in the middle, but the real critical things were the first and last step to know when you're starting and finishing the run of stairs. So it was sort of working through that and working with the users to figure out what was a sort of optimal setting uh, for the various types of experiences you would have on that. Uh, yeah, so just to introduce, the, again, the concept of the circulation loop and how we organize spaces. Um, the room numbering ended up being a, a central component to wayfinding. We wanted it to be very intuitive where you come into the main lobby and that's kind of like room number zero. And as you go um, counterclockwise around the space, the numbers increase in sequential order. So the corners are 20, 40, 60, 80, um, and the numbering follows that logic. So if you, you know if your room number is, you know, 940, you're going to be in a certain corner of the building, same as if it was 1040 on the floor upstairs, just to make it, um, you know, intuitive for folks to navigate. Uh, we did uh, a series of mock-ups on the signage, again, to emphasize high contrast. Um, Another element of the design brief that we didn't really talk about before was that the lighthouse absolutely didn't want the space to look like it was overly adapted or that it was um, different from a normal 
office space that you might encounter anywhere else. They wanted the, the cues and the aspects that are, um, you know, uh, focused on the blind and low vision experience to be subtle and not have it scream social services organization. And so one of the ways we did that was um, we um, had a series of mock-ups for the signage, really emphasizing the room number um, on a high contrast background. And that was kind of larger than um, a room number you might see in other places. But then the, the rest of the room ID sign was, you know, kind of code minimum in terms of uh, contrast and braille and raised lettering. Um, and as far as the Braille goes, Naomi has some good insight on that. So I'll say in addition to the sign up here that you see has a very large white 955. Um, and below that, it has in Braille 955. Um, but typically on a sign, if you look, I don't know, behind you, there's a few signs over on these rooms. They, they usually have that raised print um, on the sign itself. However, there's a maximum height that's readable by somebody who's reading the raised print. Not everybody reads Braille, but some people do read a raised print, and it can only be up to two inches high. However, that's not very readable for all low vision users, and so they came up with this great system of kind of a duplicate um, process. So up here, we it says 955 in raised print. Um, it's black, though, so it doesn't stand out. You're not trying to be visible uh, visually. And then Braille, it says 955. Below that, it says conference room in raised print, which does contrast, and it should. And below that, it says conference room in Braille. Pretty much all the signs that had two words in them failed our signage checking process. So our department actually does, we check everything from mayor's office on disability to make sure that the signs comply with uh, ADA code. And I don't know who, we could point a lot of fingers. I don't know whose fault it was, but a lot of things, like instead of kitchen, it said kick in. Um, they were using the wrong font. It was some old font that had been uh, apparently discontinued. Anyway, we, we had a whole deal trying to get those replaced. So Braille is very particular because it, um, it needs to be a specific font size and also have spacing. It's, um, each Braille cell is the exact same space as every other Braille cell, including a space. And so a space takes up an entire Braille cell. On these signs, the space doesn't take up a whole Braille cell, so it's kind of conference room is kind of mashed together. Um, as one very quick, sorry, um, how Braille, how particular Braille is, um, we had somebody asking us recently if they could make a key for a map on the opposite side of the map, and I said, well, then it's upside down, and if you look at the number four upside down in Braille, it actually reads, quote, people. And so... You can't, you can't just flip Braille upside down. Yeah. All right. Quickly talk. Yeah. Uh, so I'll try to get through this quick. But um, it, another thing to know about the lighthouse is that there's, um, there are many very tech-savvy people uh, within the lighthouse and within the blind community in general. Um, but the accessibility to various forms of tech is pretty varied. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of folks in the blind community use Apple OS, for example, because the accessibility features in the iOS are far beyond what's, what's in Android, right? And that's something that's built into that system, and it's, it's kind of like one of those, one of those uh, tidbits that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you talk to, talk to a blind person. Um, one of the things we talked about a lot, though, is that um, the world used to be, the, te the world of technology used to be a more accessible place, right? When everything was physical knobs and switches, it was easy to know what, where things were and what the status of things is. But as you get, you know, more into, you know, a Nest thermometer rather than the old style thermometer, uh, Title 24 light switches that have to have the occupancy sensors versus an on and off switch, um, you know, these, the, the, the logic of what's happening starts to disappear to even a very tech-savvy blind person. Um, one of the big things was like, you know, I'm sure you go into your rooms here and try to turn on the AV and make sure the sound works and the right things up on the screen. Um, if that's all controlled by a touch panel, like a blind person would have no, you know, no idea what was on there. So even with a very tech-savvy client, um, we had to kind of go back to square one to figure out how to make the what actually became a very high-tech AV system accessible to them. Um, 
So I meant to put a few process slides in here, but basically what we did was we took uh, you know, the, a conference room control panel like you see there and just did a tactile print of it, of all the different menus and of all the different features. Oh, it is, okay, cool. Um, and there were a lot of questions as to why on earth you would ever design something like that, which is probably most people's experiences with a corporate AV. Um, so it was a really interesting process of kind of like peeling back all those layers and, and questioning why the things were being programmed the way they were, um, and then kind of designing from a more human-centered experience. What we ended up with was this crazy synthesizer-looking thing. Um, so basically, you know, you had to have something that, that did have physical switches and had to react to the state of the conference room. So if you, you know, selected the front laptop and if you turned up the volume, all these faders and knobs will actually move. They're all motorized and to show you the, the state of the room. Um, fascinating process. So many opinions on this. That's, that's definitely one thing about, about any user group, but uh, particularly on the Lighthouse project. Like, you know, something like, should this interface talk? You know, should it have audio feedback? I think it was very passionately divided down the middle <laughs> of like, it absolutely has to talk, it won't be accessible if it doesn't, versus absolutely not, I hate that, you know, it's gonna, gonna be blabbing away when I'm just trying to switch my laptop. Um, so the way we kind of, um, you know, did this was to, to try to mock everything up, just like the process that Katie was talking about. So every single piece of gear, you know, we got a sample of it, tried to have a, uh, someone from the lighthouse use it and break it and see how they broke it and then, you know, get a different one or hack that one and ended up with this very, you know, again, very high tech but very customized system. That's the last slide. Let's open our questions up to the floor with the, the time we have left because all of you have been so diligent and uh, attentive today. I want to make sure we can answer some questions you may have. Hi, uh, my name is Katie. So one question I have is how exactly do the sound shape a room or how can a room be shaped specifically around sound? And this is something that um, I'm looking at for my thesis. Yeah, so... Um, basically, like architecture is like what you'll have you'll have an acoustics of a space whether you want to or not, right? Acoustics is nothing more than the architecture, and the architecture will get you the acoustics. So it's a it's a combination of the the size of the room, the room volume, uh, the geometry of the room, whether it's you know rectilinear, curved, or you know more kind of articulated, and then the finish. So um, typically, you, you know by default, materials are Reflective, like drywall, concrete, glass, those are all reflective materials. So if you have a large space that you don't consider, um, you know, the acoustics of, that would be a loud and reverberant space. Uh, when we say reverberant, that's like the amount of sound that reflects. Um, so a high reverberation is, is like a very echoey kind of live space. Um, so the the design of which surfaces to put where is kind of, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what we do at my job is to, to take a space and to figure out the program and figure out how important each of those things are, right? Because, you know, if you, if you have a space that would by default be concrete, glass, and drywall, and then you want to add sound absorbing material to it, it's both a, you know, design intervention, but also an added cost. So there's always a balance of, you know, how much do you want to control the acoustics versus what's actually going to happen in there, so. So, but you can also just sort of hear the dif different aspects and bif different things about the space. So if you think about that loop on each floor, um, especially the tenth floor, if, if you go from the, the north end of the building closer to Market Street and you're walking back towards where the stairs are, you can hear when you enter into that reception space. There's a difference in sound. There's a bit of an acoustic threshold as you pass between the two spaces. And then the reverberance really changes in there. And so you can really hear that transition as you're moving through the building. If you're on the other side walking near the elevator, you can hear the, the sound, the reverberation really getting pulled off uh, towards where the elevators are. And it's really, it really has a deep, much more um, 
reverberant space coming from that space. So we, we sort of talk a lot about using acoustics to spatialize, where you, you can, it's not that you just hear the space, but you can locate things in space. And you can just, by tapping your cane as you go by, you can hear that that's where the elevator lobby is. So there, there are things we can do to design that uh, and to try to, to accentuate that to a level that can be uh, much more intentional and, and uh, useful. Hi, um, two questions actually. Um, I was wondering how the ADA um, is perceived by um, those who are able to experience it uh, more, uh, if the standards feel very um, more top down or is it very considerate of the situations of people who really need those uh, or standards, uh, especially. And uh, another question is that, like, what are the points that design disciplines should be aware of to make more inclusive design without overly or solely obeying the codes? Uh, one difference I experienced going from an architect uh, to sort of joining the disability community or community of people with disabilities was that in architecture, at least at the time, we really sort of approached uh, the ADA and uh, California accessibility regulations is like the ultimate of what you had to do. You know, it's like that's all that's needed. Uh, whereas within the design, the uh, community of people with disabilities, it was more like that's the threshold. That's a good place to start. Uh, and that, that's sort of the minimum level of expectation. Uh, and it's really intended as that. It's for a very general purpose. It's for general use, of sort of the public uh, accommodation. Uh, but that's not, it's really the least, the least to be done. Uh, so there are other things that can be done. And quite frankly, within the blind uh, community, there's a lot of things, uh, there are things there that are about safety. It's about hazardous warning strips, whether it's at the platform edge at a BART station or at a curb ramp uh, at, you know, at a intersection uh, to get into a crosswalk. Uh, it's really that hazardous warning street to alert you of that transition from the sidewalk into the, into the vehicular way. There's tactile you know, uh, requirements of, in elevators and for room signage, uh, whether that's braille or raised characters, as Naomi described. Uh, so there's all sorts of things, but like, for instance, I did some consulting work on the Trans Bay, the Salesforce Transit Center. And, and looking at that, it's like, wayfinding, we could use room numbering at the lighthouse for wayfinding. And you could understand where you needed to go just by hearing where the room was or checking a sign, checking the next one, and you could really quickly determine where you need to go. Well, there are no room signs on the bus deck at the Salesforce Transit Center. And it's a four block long space. And if you put wayfinding signage up, it's not gonna make any use for someone who's, who's uh, blind and doesn't have enough sight to be able to read a high uh, visible contrasting sign. And you can't put braille overhead. I do have a photograph of a friend who's on a ladder with her dog down on the ground and she's up reading the, si the sign in braille that's up high in the space. <laughs> doesn't work very well. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, it's, there are things that don't work well. Uh, there, there are some gaps that, that just don't get covered, and that's why we had this sort of great collaboration with, uh, with Shane and the Arab sound people in the sound lab of trying to, to design more strategically with acoustics and all sorts of other sensory experiences. And it's really that, that sense of the multisensory palette of, of, a, of a design of a space, urban space or architectural space that can really start to make it more accessible uh, for the blind and visually impaired. And it's nothing that you would ever find in any code uh, guideline, uh, accessibility guideline. Uh, I'm trying to remember your second question. Oh, it's just a general design. Um, the points that design disciplines should be aware of to make more inclusive design that doesn't only obey the codes. Yeah, a big part of that is to be aware of it. It's, we often design for ourselves. Uh, I think of the, in, in sort of the, to, to especially in an academic setting like this, 
to do the heretical. It's like Frank Lloyd Wright was the absolute worst at this. He designed for Frank. Uh, I went to one of his buildings, uh, college campus, Florida, uh, Southern, uh, it was a campus in Florida, and uh, I'm 6'4", and sighted walking around. I was having to duck everywhere I went. Frank, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was five foot two, something like that, and he designed for his eye. I have later heard that his assistant that was with him for years and years, his lead assistant, was 6'4". He was banging his head, ducking everywhere he went. Frank Lloyd Wright, he never cared. He was like, anything above six foot, I think it was like 6'2", he thought was a waste. Okay, <laughs> let's design for Frank. Uh, so anyway, the this, this sense of uh, designing not for your own experience, but expanding your, your awareness to take in sort of the experience of all sorts of people, whether it's you know, gender equities in, in design, uh, whether it's uh, uh, cultural issues, different levels of abilities. We've had a, a, a history of really designing for sort of like this really narrow understanding of what the human what would be that would use the space. And I really take it sort of as a challenge not to, not to compromise the architecture, but to embrace that level of diversity and that level of difference to find ways to make the, the space that much more exciting and creative through a really creative response to sort of the opportunities that are created. And if you're designing that way from the get-go, it's not going to feel like uh, sort of a, a highly adapted space, and it'll work really sort of organically and naturally. All right. So um, in terms of circulation, I could understand how the space, the lobby that was shown there was designed for, for people to understand where to go. Uh, is there like a, I don't want to say generic, but a pre-standardized way to design a, a space that has logistic um, and in that space, we we could see the the hole in, in between uh, the desk and and like some other uh, furniture. But is there another yes, like a pre-standard way uh, to design these spaces for for uh, for people with with um, this condition? Um, I don't know if I'm. For for K news, you mean? Not to send resources. Um, what I'm trying to say is, so they work with with the space within the boundaries they they already have. But uh, is there a pre-established way to to understand how uh, people in this condition could could um, walk through the space in, the space in more specific way, like having the the desk ne next to the bathroom, or I I'm talking about like program, but uh, are they parts of the program that go next to each other that make more logic in terms of circulation? Um, I would say that there's the short answer is no. There's really not a standard way, but the through the programming process with the lighthouse, we worked out those um, like logical sequences to organize the programs of the space in a way that made the most sense for them. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, like whether there's kind of a, a more standard or known way to navigate through the space, like, you know, again, that's really unique to each project. Um, and it was certainly unique to the Lighthouse project and the Lighthouse users. And, and like Shane said, I think that everyone had a very strong opinion that was very different. And so building consensus among the users was really important and um, a big part of the design process. I wonder, Chris, do you want to add to it? That, that question made me think about the sort of early design of the, of the reception area. If you can remember, Katie, there was, in, coming off the elevator, you would turn out into the space and the reception desk was front and center, 
in the middle of the space. And, and that's really fantastic because you can't miss it. You know, the notion is sort of a strategy is, you know, a, motion in, a body in motion stays in motion until hit upon by a, you know, equal and opposite force that, that takes you to the reception desk. Yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but then uh, that reception desk itself starts, starts to dominate the space. And then it was actually in the conversations with, with uh, Brian Bashan and, and things that we, we, we looked at sort of not having that be so obvious and letting the human aspect. You know, we had the recording of, of uh, the guy, uh, Ben, who used to be the receptionist at, at Arup, saying, uh, good morning, welcome to the, to the lighthouse. And sort of letting that human aspect, that social connection, be the welcome as opposed to this frontal uh, condition, which then opened up the whole space to be appreciated for the stairs behind it that you could see and you could hear as opposed to losing the stairs behind the, the reception desk. So it was somewhat of a counterintuitive notion about what's the, the best way to flow through that space. But there are things that are intuitive and logical uh, and others that are counterintuitive, uh, but there's no set rules and guidelines for that. Uh, it, and it really does sort of become a function of the sequence of things that lead up to it and where, it, where you need to go. And, uh, so it's a, a, a much broader, more nuanced, complex question. I'm not sure if this exactly speaks to what you're asking, but in terms of wayfinding, um, something that's going to work well for somebody who's blind is also going to work really well for somebody who's sighted, where if you make a very long, meandering hallway that goes back and forth and turns, you're going to lose your orientation which direction you're facing, no matter what your orientation skills, if you're sighted or blind. Um, and so, you know, Chris had mentioned it's hard to walk through a big open space. You know, walls are great to be able to find with your cane, not having spaces where you can just, like, throw a little table and chairs over there that someone's going to walk into. You know, these are the kinds of the movable elements um, are also to be considered. I don't know if that helped at all. Um, I'm just curious about the acoustics. I saw you guys used a lot of material, but did you guys explore anything about like forms and different shapes that can redirect it? So maybe like if it curved, you can like redirect it so it sounds like it's elongated hallway or? Yeah, I, there was actually a lot of, one of the debates early on was how much of the community could um, basically echolocate. There's jo Josh Mealy was was big on this that he, you know, like he could hear re reflections from articulated surfaces. Um, in the end, we didn't get into that type of detail for a couple reasons. One, it's it's a lot of architecture. Like it's you know we'd have to make big formal moves to to have that be obvious. So um, to on the you know when Katie was talking about how we didn't want it to seem like a what did you call it like an overdesigned space or. Overly adapted, yeah. Um, the, you know, we decided to go for more of the, like, uh, gradients of absorption and reflection rather than specific shaping. Um, and then there's also a cost element. You know, when you get, like, big, like, m big surfaces that reflect sound in specific ways, you start to, you know, use custom materials like, uh, you know, like uh, fiber-reinforced concrete and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that was part of it as well. We did we did early on talk a lot about whether we wanted a, a sound exhibit in the lobby space, um, and we had some conversations about piping sound up from Market Street and what various like ways of like creating a fun you know kind of exploratorium kind of kind of piece that that used sound. Um, we didn't get there on this one, but someday, someday maybe we'll add it into the lobby. I think I have a wrap-up question, knowing that everybody's um, s starting to, uh, to fade. This is a question from a student, and um, I think it's a, a great question for Chris. Um, if you compare how you think about design, how you initiate it, the first steps of design, compare what you used to do as an architect to how you initiate design thinking now, is there a few sentences you can give us? 
I'd say that the real difference now is um, I'm more in the space. Uh, when I read drawings, even if it's a, like an initial just background drawing or a site drawing, when I'm reading a drawing through touch, I'm not looking at it for its aesthetic you know, um, success or intrigue or whatever. It's like I'm at the tip of my fingertip, sort of in the, in the space. And as you work with that as a, as a designer, as an architect, it's such a much more powerful way of thinking about and conceiving of the architecture is really imagining that whole spectrum within your brain, within your creativity of, of thinking about the whole experience, about you know, that logical flow, where you want to go, what you want to experience, where the sun is, where the winds are coming from. And it's, it's a much more sort of physical extrapolation on an intellectual level and a creative level of trying to understand things uh, through that sort of whole, holistic human body experience. So that to me, uh, it's, I know it's like you're, you're taught in school to think about that, to not just look at the drawing, but to, to imagine being in it. Uh, I always found that intriguing, but kind of complex, to, hard to do if I'm just looking at the drawing. So reading through touch, it's it's really amazing the difference. It's kind of just puts me inside the space, and and then through that, it sort of activates the all those things that you you work with to to really sort of craft the space and and fully embody what you're trying to do that experience. Well, on behalf of the School of Architecture, I would like to tell you that this discussion has been hugely informative. I think it's been fascinating. I think it's opened us all up to a new way of, of thinking um, that we probably haven't experienced before. Um, and certainly really refocused an awareness on human-centered design. So I want to thank all of you for shaping and sharing this unique design process, your experience of it. Um, and I think we'll all be much more mindful in, in our designs going forward to accommodate the widest range of um, people and their you know, different disabilities or abilities, um, as the case may be. So thank you. Um, I don't know if our panelists might stick around for a little bit if there's still some burning questions, but um, we'd appreciate that. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>